Hey, everybody. This is going to be a great conversation. I'm joined by Gregor Fusionegger from Austria, and he's working on a PhD, and he's asked me to answer some questions about teaching, about improvisation, technology, and related questions. All right. So why is it important to teach improvisation from the beginning? That's a good question. What technical tools do I currently use? I feel strongly about a lot of the tools and the technology that we can use. And how can we use today's technology for practice? Great question. Where do I see further developments for instrumental teaching in the future? Great question. Do I see disadvantages in using current technologies for sure? And what are my hopes for instrumental teaching? These are great questions, actually. It's, it's great stuff. So many great reasons to teach improvisation from the beginning. I've heard a lot of teachers say over time that one must teach fundamentals first. They must teach technique first, which I think is a flawed assumption because I think it the reason we're in the position we're in now is because of that assumption and it's like a never-ending thing because if you're like first you have to learn finger placement in the left hand and you have to learn bow technique before you can learn improvisation it's like that never ends you could always say but you got to get to book three or no really you should get to book six or book eight and then by the time if a kid starts playing when they're five years old and then by the time they're nine or ten or twelve or fourteen they're already probably feeling like anything that departs from these technical exercises they've been doing feels scary. There's an element of conditioning. I think improvisation can happen right from the beginning because there are so many positive benefits that come from learning improvisation, and I don't see why we need to wait, basically. Now, I will say that there are different ways to teach improvisation, and this is part of the problem as well. A five-year-old kid may be resistant to learning music theory. They may be not ready to learn note reading right away or not be able to do it really right away. So we don't want to necessarily teach improvisation in a way that requires note reading or requires quote unquote theory. So a, a great analogy that I would give would be the way that kids are encouraged to pick up drawing and coloring. A three-year-old kid could be given finger paints and a piece of paper, and they could be shown what the paints do very quickly. Just put your fingers in the paints and smush them around on the paper. And the kid can figure it out, <laughs> which is not to say that like you can't learn all those techniques of fine art too, right? Like you can learn techniques for drawing and perspective and color blending, but we don't need to teach kids that for them to start getting excited about it. So I think the same thing could be true of music. And I think it's up to us as teachers to find the ways to facilitate and encourage that improvisation. The benefits of improvisation, number one, it just brings me a lot of satisfaction. I think it brings students a lot of satisfaction when they can make something that is their own. And there's a lot of other parallels in life when a kid goes to class and they have to make something, they make a project, and then they take pride in that project that they designed that they have a lot of creativity. There's creativity in playing Twinkle Little Star or the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto. But I think there's a different level of creativity and also there's a different kind of satisfaction that we get from creating our own composition in a way or improvisation. And I wouldn't limit it to improvisation. I would say that composition or arranging music or any kind of creative musical process can be really valuable. I think kids making recordings, videos of themselves, and being able to hold those videos and witness those videos can be really powerful, can be really interesting and helpful for them. Number two, and pride that comes with that, it expands our ability to have music be a powerful force in our own life for navigating the difficulties of life. How many times have we as musicians noticed that our relationship with music helps us to get through other things in life, many types of things. Even this week, I've had that situation where something difficult was happening, and I found a refuge in being able to engage in a musical project. 
an ability to process my feelings, an ability to somehow manage those difficulties that I was feeling by having this constant of the relationship with music and the soothing that it brings to me. And I think that all teachers would say that we want our students to have a lifelong relationship with music, or we hope that could be possible for them in any way. And so I think improvisation makes that much more possible for them to have a, a longer term relationship with music. Because otherwise, if the only way you can play music is an orchestra, it really relies on a lot of infrastructures. Those infrastructures are not always easy to come by. But if you have a, a, a self-sustaining way to engage with music that doesn't require all of these outside infrastructures, it can be very useful. Do you have any follow-up questions on that? Not really. I, I think you, you gave a very clear position to this topic. I had an experience with a young student. She's learning the violin now since a bit more than a year. And I started from scratch with her, like showing her how to hold the instrument, to play and plug empty strings. And I immediately started this approach. I told her, we can try to stay in rhythm, like in a 4-4 beat. And you plug now, I plug empty strings with the pinky finger. I play some patterns just in a 4-4 beat in a certain tempo and then I play it and then you repeat and then we switch roles and you give me an example. You come up with something and I repeat it. And so this way I went from posture to then holding the bow to do the same thing with empty strings with the bow. So I, I saw very great enthusiasm from all my students with who I made watch and I'm seeing they have a lot of fun doing it. They learn the basic technique of the instrument just on their instrument without any help of a school or a system that explains you page by page how to place first finger or second finger and so on. And I really see it works. And for example, I gave her pieces to learn by ear. She wanted to learn Eine kleine Nachtmusik from Mozart. I come up with an easy arrangement in first position using simple fingerings. And then she played that. We didn't even finish the whole piece. I gave it to her in chunks, like small couple of bars and she played the practice that at home next lesson we added the next few bars then she played from bar one to bar six and so on and then we didn't even finish that but in the next lesson she finished the composition on her own like she just knew how it sounds she listened to the tune and she played an ending to it that was such an amazing encounter for me that she was really working thinking on her own at home how do i want to end this piece and without any instruction it just came from her own um, initiative. And I thought that was super beautiful. Couldn't imagine any better result I could hope for in that regard. How old is, your, is the student? She's about 10 years old now. Actually, that just brings to mind so many other things about this question. I'm glad that you shared that story. You were integrating the use of improvisation with bow technique, with left hand technique, as you pointed out, which is it's so important to say that like they, they're not separate. They don't have to be separate. They can be taught together and it can be more useful because number one, it might be fun instead of just let me show you how to hold the bow, which kind of sounds boring. <laughs> Let's do yeah. this fun thing. And by the way, hold your bow like this. So that's one thing that came to mind. Second of all, just the way you described how you were providing a framework and a structure for her to succeed in that improvisational process, I think is very important. You described something like, hey, I'll pluck a note, then you pluck a note. Even within that, there's so much structure and clarity. And this is a big part of what people miss, as I was referencing earlier, they're like, we need to play over a chord progression, or we need to play, we need to know theory or read no this. No, no. The, the structure you provided is perfect. I pluck a note, you pluck a note, right? And there's another part of it's super important. The direction you give the student is something completely within their ability, completely within their ability. It requires no more learning. They didn't have to learn a scale. They didn't have to learn a chord. They didn't have to learn a new technique. They learned to hold the bow, but they could do it. Even if they held the bow wrong, they could still do the exercise. The third thing about it that I usually share with like how to succeed with improvisation, there's a couple of other things that, that sometimes arise for some people, but it sounds like it was a non-issue for your student, which proves the point that we only learn to be afraid later in life 
or at least supports that idea. Because a lot of times people, we can give them clarity and structure. We can tell them to do something that's within their comfort zone, but they still feel afraid. And usually that's because they're afraid of making something sound quote unquote bad. We want to take the idea of making something good or bad. We want to take this completely out of the exercise. Like the goal is not to make something sound good. The goal is just to make something. So some people struggle with that. And I think some teachers struggle with it because they feel it. They feel the anxiety and they're not even comfortable necessarily modeling to a student what it might sound like to play something that doesn't sound quote unquote good. If I was modeling for a student, I might say, hey, play six pizzicato notes, right? That doesn't sound refined, but that's not the point. If a teacher can model that, then the student can hear that and be like, oh, I can do that, right? Instead of having that anxiety. There's this idea of social emotional learning. For many students, they can have emotional benefits of doing creative work on their instrument, separate from trying to meet a standard, meeting a standard of the Tchaikovsky violin concerto or the, the Rococo variations for cellists. Why do we want to always be telling a student, showing them that they're either measuring up to a standard or not measuring up as to a standard. The standard is Hillary Hahn. Who can measure up to that? You know what I mean? Which it's great to pursue that, but it's also great to have this other thing where you get to define your own standard and nobody sounds like you. So whatever you do, it's going to be great. And by the way, kids can do improvisation together in groups. And so there is a social dynamic of this very special, much like playing any chamber music, but it requires yeah. a less of a bar to get to. So if you had two of your students, you could have them engage in these processes, the same structures you were engaging with your student, mm. and then you could have them create new structures. They get to actually engage in making variations on the structure. So your first structure was, I play a note, then you play a note. I play a note, then you play a note. Then you could say to your student, how could we change the rules of this game? And then the student gets to decide the game. And then now they're really composing and improvising on a whole other level. And then they could do that with their friend or with yeah. three friends. And there's so many amazing dynamics that happen socially when we put kids in the opportunity to do that. Yeah, just one thing you mentioned, I was really curious if you could give an example of how you do this with groups, uh, with children, let's say, how would you uh, approach an improv session where you hand over the, the task of improvising to the students? Uh, I don't know, in one of your workshops, how would you approach this? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked. I do it with small groups, but also large groups. I pluck one note, then you pluck a note, then I pluck a note, then you pluck a note. That is a structure, period. That is very clear. And if the child's, what do you mean pluck a note? Then you can show them. You take your finger and you go like this. And if you hit two strings, it doesn't matter. <laughs> That's it. So it's, I play a note. Now she plays a note. Then I play a note. Then she plays a note. Then I play a note. And you can do that forever. So then you say to her and another student, you say, okay, you guys do it without me and they'll be able to do it without you. And then the next thing that you would say would be, does either of you have an idea about how we could change the rules of this game? And there are so many easy ways that the kids will come up with on their own, but if they don't, you can give them ideas. So for oh, example, yeah. what if we each pluck two notes? Okay, great. So that's a variation on the structure. What if we have the choice between one or two notes. What if we play three notes? What if we can choose between one, two, or three notes? What if I play a note and then you wait a longer time and then you play two notes and then I wait and I play three notes and then you play four notes? What if yeah. we get louder as we do it? What if we have an expression that we can say that is stop? And then whenever one of us says stop, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I think so. One idea that again popped to my mind when you were talking about this now is that I think in general, in music education, 
there is maybe a, a little bit of a lack in bringing the students together to actually work on stuff together that not only it's a relationship student teacher and i tell you something you do it but i would see so much benefit in encouraging the students in creative ways of learning from each other and supporting each other in the learning process by improvising together how you mentioned to come up with actual ideas how to teach each other and i'm just the observer of that maybe i, I just give hints try that maybe and what about this idea when i studied in universities in austria i always got so much motivation from our group lessons actually where our teacher we would meet once per week in the university and play for each other and then give feedback to each other i got 10 times the motivation to keep on practicing and improving myself because I knew I have to show something to my colleagues who are on a similar level like me. So I don't want to disappoint myself or them. And I want to give constructive feedback to them. So I need to listen also very carefully. I need to observe very detailed what they are doing and listen to it very carefully so that I can give the feedback. So that would foster in the kids already the ability to give constructive feedback to each other and to even get in the role of the teacher at a very early stage. I think this could be very, very beneficial for no matter what you learn. Like it could even be not even an instrument, take any field of craftsmanship. <laughs> if we think about the chamber music coaching, right? Like string quartet coaching and string trio coaching or piano trio with violin child, right? These were some of the most important moments for me in my education, playing in a string quartet because the bond that you create, right? And the lessons that I learned from my chamber music coaches about teamwork and communication and the importance of trying everyone's ideas it was so important. But also if we think about chamber music in the sense of classical music, again, we can't escape the fact that within a string quartet, you may have somebody who's like on a very higher level of ability to measure up to this standard that's been predefined of the Mozart piece or the Tchaikovsky piece, right? And somebody else who's a little less able to meet certain standards, right? So there is some hierarchy that occurs. There's some maybe embarrassment that some people feel and that they need to hide or that, that their contribution is not as important. But in this creative context, we can truly see each artist as being equal in value and appreciating them for their difference of approach because it's not about this set of standards. It's a different kind of standard where if I ask you, who do you love, Herbie Hancock or Joni Mitchell? I love them both equally. The yeah. question of comparing them as or putting them one up or one down, it, it, it can't even really be, there's no point to it because they're so original, they're so much themselves. And this is really valuable also in an orchestra. In the United States, we have classroom orchestras for children that go to public schools. When you have somebody sitting in the last chair in the second violins and the first chair in the first violins, there's going to be a gap in their engagement and in the pride and all these kinds of things. But if we make more space and time for these creative activities, that last chair second violin player can feel as important, as respected, as valuable as the concertmaster, or even more. In fact, that was the experience that I had in my high school orchestra. The last chair, I was the concertmaster, but the last chair second violin was this guy who made like four track cassette tapes of his original songs and he would sing and he would play the drums and it was amazing he inspired me in fact he was a part of the reason that i do what i do today is because i was so enamored by his willingness to be creative and all the other kids loved him they were so attracted to him because he had this unique personality this willingness to be himself unabashedly himself and he was really an eccentric person and we should all be learning to appreciate our own eccentricities and celebrating our own eccentricities rather than feeling ashamed that we're not meeting one standard i do a lot of these types of free slash structured improvisations because 
it's free in the sense that it's not requiring predefined harmonic thing or a predefined rhythmic thing or a formal song structure. It's free from those restraints, but it's highly structured. Like I play a note, then you play a note. That is a structure. And I sometimes refer to this as what I call, quote unquote, elemental forms. So like literally finding the simplest aspects of structure and then just mm. using them very clearly. And you can use them for a kid to improvise alone or in a group or with the teacher or with their friends. And these are a lot of the, the exercises that I take through people on my Zoom classes and also in live workshops. And I have a lot of curriculum on this. I have like, I've kind of cataloged like different ways of providing these types of structures for people that I find to be very useful and helpful and, a, and like a launching point for more of creating your own structures. So there's a couple levels here. One is that you're saying to the student, improvise and I will give you the structure. And then the next level is where you're saying you decide the structure, however long it can take for you to give them structures. But sometimes it can be very quick. In fact, I have this game called the sentence game. And this is how it works. We'll pretend that you're a 10 year old. I say a word, you say a word, I say a word, you say a word, I say a word, you say a word until one of us says period, which is full stop in the UK. We say period in the United States. Do you want to start or do you want me to start? You start. Okay. Today. We. Will. Do. This. Amazing conversation together <laughs> period full stop that's it See, we just did it that's the sentence game okay so the next level that i do is i say now let's do it with our instruments and so very much like you did with your student i'll say so i'll play a note then you play a note then i play a note then you play a note until one of us says okay good you've got your instrument <laughs> And we can do it with the right. bow or the pizzicato. So already here's an opportunity for variation in structure. Would you like to do it with the bow or with the pizzicato? Oh, let's do it with the bow. Okay. Would you like to start first or would you like for me to start first? And you start again. All right. So here, and then, so I play note, then you play note, then I play note, then you play note until one of us says full stop or period. All right. So here we go. Period. Full stop. That's it. Okay. So now at this point, I can either give the student more examples of structures and be like, okay, this time, instead of saying full stop or period, one of us can say question mark to end the, the phrase, or I'll say, let's play two notes each, or you play pizzicato and I play with the bow or only on the G string. Like I might suggest like a couple more variations or two notes each, right? But then at some point, and maybe even right away, I will say, how would you imagine that we could change the rules? And usually a student is very quick to have a thousand ideas. And we'll just keep doing these. We do three of them, we do 10 of them, we do 20 of them, we record them, we say, go share them with your parents. The videos we made, wasn't that fun? Congratulations, you're really creative, it was great. I could really hear your personality and I loved your ideas and I love how you expressed yourself through that. And you can have the, the kid can do it with the other. So you can use that if you want, Gregor, that's called the sentence game. It's a, it's an easy win every time. It's great. It's great. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to make one other point about the importance of teaching improvisation, which I think what we've already alluded that we're celebrating a student, their personal intuition the choices that they make that come from their unique values and interests, right? Mm -hmm. It's celebrating the value of each individual, each person, and really propping them up and saying that regardless of how you meet some other standard, you are valued and you have, and not only are you valued where you are right now, but you have this ability to 
develop your voice in such a, a highly unique way to, to further and further degrees until you're like Jody Mitchell or Herbie Hancock. And, and I think is also important for reasons of talking in the classroom and in the culture of music education about diversity, equity, and inclusion, which in the United States, it may be spoken about differently in Austria or in Europe, but I know that in the, in the United States, it's an important topic. I, I'm not like the greatest authority on it, but it's something that I'm intensely interested in. I'll give an example. The other day, I was teaching in a high school orchestra classroom, and high school is age 15 to 18 in the United States. There might have been middle school there as well. So there's probably 70, 80 students. And I have a sequence where I teach Paco Bell's canon, but then I teach it as a reggae style and as an Appalachian bluegrass style, and then as a bossa nova style, and then as a heavy metal style. In the beginning of one of those, I said, hey, now we're gonna do it as a reggae style. And and so you can imagine that if Paco Bell lived in Jamaica, he might have used this approach instead of the Austrian or German or whatever he was. Because the music from Jamaica is just as important and as meaningful and just as helpful and deep as the music from Germany. And I just feel like people need to hear that. And especially people want to hear that their culture is meaningful. If there's a kid that happens to be from Jamaica in orchestra, I want for that kid to be able to hear that the music of their culture is meaningful too. Yeah, you, and I'm just now imagining like some reggae tune played in an orchestra. That would be amazing. I would love to hear that. Some people have spoken actually to the question of does every string class need to be an orchestra does it need to be an orchestra yeah does reggae need to be played in orchestra even just this framework of an orchestra can feel limiting or constricted and tied to these historical kind of compromised issues i'm just saying like how do we cultivate <clears throat> respect celebration curiosity appreciation for diversity, you know, not only in the cultural sense, but also at the individual level, every person. And I believe that improvisation can help to do this in a lot of ways. And some we've already discussed, it's people have different kinds of quote unquote, let's say abilities, right? Not everybody has five fingers on their hand, right? Some people's fingers are shorter. Some people's fingers are longer. So th the way I understand this is that it's differences in quote unquote ability, but we want to respect differences in ability. We also want to re respect and celebrate different value systems, different ways of thinking about the world, different language, different ways of approaching everything. I think like the ways in which the West has over time come to respect Eastern medicine, for example, we could look at this in terms of what we're doing in music education as really branching out and seeing that, wait, there are frameworks and there are approaches to music that we can be more curious about. So this next question you're asking about technology for practice and technology for teaching, right? Yeah. I think email is an underutilized thing. Are you on my email list by any chance? Do you get my emails? Yeah. I don't know if it's the only newsletter, but to one I'm subscribed to. Yeah. yeah. So how long have you been subscribed to my newsletter? I don't know. I remember back in the time I contacted you like how many years ago, four years ago, I think it was for my bachelor thesis. We had an interview once <laughs> and then I stopped the subscription because I had to focus on so many things. And, and then now in my research, while getting now the materials together for my master thesis, I again subscribe to your newsletter. <laughs> yeah. And I actually, I found out about you in the initially through the Bulletproof Musician podcast, where I heard an interview with you and the creator of the website, Noah, was is his name? Yeah. Still also subscribe to his newsletters. So I think they're great. Yeah. So since that time, since I discovered this interview, I got really interested in your approach on teaching and how you provide materials online for students and how you connect to people with all over the world. Yeah. 
exactly. And so it's possible that like you reaching out to me for this interview in part was helped by the fact that you were getting emails from Noah, my friend Noah Kagiyama, bulletproofmusician.com, that you got emails from Noah. And what was he doing though? He was teaching. He was saying, hey, if you're interested in improvisation, here's this guy, Christian Howes, who teaches about it. And here's an, an interview we did. And so by virtue of that email that he sent you, you learned something. And then it connected you to me and my newsletters. The thing is that teaching and marketing, I believe, are very closely connected. And as teachers, we need to see that part of our role is enrolling people motivating students, giving them inspiration, giving them accountability, being top of mind, being on their radar. So when you resubscribe to my newsletter, there's a chance that you got an email from me every day for a couple of weeks, at least. And that is a sequence of emails that is programmed. Anybody listening to this can go to christianhouse.com. You can subscribe for my email list. You get a bunch of free things right off the bat and you get an email like every day or every other day for me for weeks and each email teaches you something it either teaches you something in the email and or it sends you to a video or a conversation or a blog post or whatever but it's all ways to teach these are all ways to teach the more ways we can show up for people not only to provide them information through reading through information, through listening, information through playing along on a play along video, the more formats and the more frequency that we're constantly inspiring them, I feel is a great way to help them to learn, but it's also a way to do it at scale. So I teach a hundred thousand people every month. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's different levels of engagement. So there's 10,000 people on my newsletter who get these emails for me that, that teach them in various capacities, but then there's usually a hundred thousand views on my YouTube channel. And there's over a thousand videos on my YouTube channel. And most of them are teaching videos. And then on social media, a lot of times I'm doing some teaching as well. And then I have people that are enrolled in like this level of maybe it's private lessons or they're in my group classes or they're in different levels. So even for you, who were not like enrolled in my studio, you're still getting some teaching from me just through the newsletter. So I would yeah. say people should create email drip sequences. And there are fancy ways to do this with automation, but you can also do it in simpler ways. Like you can have a Google doc or actually, you know what a great technique is to use email signatures. So in your email, program, you have a signature. Most people have a signature that says like Gregor and then your website and that's your signature. I have signatures that are three pages long. It's just an email. It's any email that you have to send more than once, but you can save it in a signature and you can probably have 50 signatures. And so if you wanted to right now today with your students, you could say, okay, every time I have a new student who contacts me or takes their first lesson, I'm going to send them signature one, then signature two, then signature three, then signature four. And then that could be a sequence of emails that you want your student to receive the first year that they study with you. And it could be teaching them all kinds of things. And there's many ways to, to organize that. So I think email is one of the greatest tools that we can use. And in fact, one of the people that I've mentored, his name's Austin Shelzo. And when I began mentoring him, he was a full-time classroom orchestra teacher. And I encouraged him to use more email to engage the parents. And so he was using email and he said that he like tripled the parent engagement. Wow. Yeah. And, and it's because this is an issue for many teachers is that like the parents need to be educated too, but you don't have the time to do that, do you? Because you need to spend time with the, with the child. Well, if you have 10 emails that you could send to the parents that educate them, and ask them questions and tell them their responsibilities and what you expect from them and how they can do a better job and what to do if they have this problem, what if do if they have that problem, what to do if they have that problem. You just write it one time and then you don't even have to write it. You can link to me <laughs> explaining the answer to the problem. You can link to some other teacher who has answered the question, right? And now you're educating every parent, you personally, Gregor, every parent of every student you have for the rest of your life you can say, here you go. 
One click, That's done. Amazing. Uh, how many of these signatures can you save at once in, in your Gmail, let's say? I'm using Gmail. I don't know. I don't use Gmail, but I know that it's an option. And I'm sure you could figure it out. I use like a fancy like software to do all these things now. Okay. But I have used signatures before. And it's just the point that like you can do everything with Google Docs, with email signatures, and with YouTube, all of which are free. You can do so much by making YouTube videos. The same thing that I'm saying, like whether you're teaching all these things in email, you can teach all the same things. It could be in a blog post and you could just send people to, here's a blog post about this. Here's a blog post about that. Here's a blog post about this. Here's a blog post about that. You could have one Google document where you just have every single blog post you've ever written or every email that you've ever composed. And it's just one Google doc with links. And I have that. For a thousand YouTube videos, I have a Google Doc that's a catalog of all of my YouTube videos by playlists because I have so many. There's a thousand. So now I have to make it easier to search. You have a Google Docs with all of these different formats for giving people the information they need. And the information they need doesn't need to be created by you. It can be linking to your favorite demonstration of a bow hold technique by another violinist. Or like a child psychologist talks about how parents can help their child practice music when they have a hard conversations or whatever. So you link to that blog that you think is a perfect answer. But you as the teacher are guiding that experience just by providing access to information in different ways and showing up on a more regular interval for people and encouraging them more. Yeah, that's really amazing. I didn't know about that possibility in the, with the signatures. That's really great. Yeah, great tool to use. So sure. there you, you answered already the two questions here, because one, which technical tool you were talking about email, and then are there <laughs> ways to use these tools better in that sense? Yes, I was using email, but not in that way so far. Yeah. Yeah. So like we're providing information to people either in text or audio or video form. And we want to be able to get it to them easily. And we want to show up for them constantly and personalize that experience, but saving time for ourselves. And this yeah. is how I teach 100,000 people a month. But it's also like during the pandemic, like Mexico did it. They taught their children in the entire country using television. And I'm sure there were problems, but the point is, there's so much education that can happen for people with YouTube. Yeah, totally. And <clears throat> sometimes they, they need a little bit of personalization. They need a little bit of feedback, but we can do this inside of a Facebook group. I use a Facebook group for my private members in my practice community where you have just one post under your post. It's a comment from me, comment from you, comment from me, comment from you, comment from me, comment from you. It's just one post with hundreds of comments in the comments. You can put text or you can put a video. I can put text or I can put a video or audio. So I have one student yesterday. I just saw she has 340 comments on this one post between me and her, most of which are videos. So she says, Chris, what should I do? I say, do this. I make a video. I say, I want you to work on this. And she says, okay, I'll do it. And then she makes a video and then she puts it back. So it costs her less money. It takes less of my time. She gets the greater value of the educational experience instead of needing to like for us to schedule an hour long lesson or whatever. And then the other students in the group, it's like group class. It's the same thing you were talking about earlier, but it's just in a Facebook group. Yeah, that's so, also amazing. Yeah. I haven't thought about this either. You should join my practice community. You'll get a lot out of it. You'll get it. You'll see how I'm teaching. I, in my practice community, not only do I teach students about improvisation or harmony or technique or whatever they want, but I also teach teachers how to teach the way that I teach in a way that's more scalable and ultimately more democratic and more affordable. In fact, my practice community is pay what you can. I have a member in my practice community from Kenya who pays $5 a month. I have a member in the United States who is a single mom who pays $15 a month. I have members in Japan, Australia, people in South America, people with different abilities to pay. And so while the 
Official price is $57, or I'm probably going to move it to $80. It's actually pay whatever you can. You tell me what you can pay. Chris, I can pay $10 a month. Okay, we'll send you a link. You subscribe, and you're a part of the community. Well, so it's incredible. Way. It's So using these methods, they make it more possible for other people to access education and great teachers. I'm teaching people for $5 a month. They're like Literally, they can have a comment. They can have 400 comments with me, with videos I make for them. They can come to my Zoom classes. I think more teachers should be making play along videos. That's what I do with the play along video where I play something and I say, you play it back and I will invite you as I've invited other teachers that if you would like to try to make some play and, and I teach teachers how to make play along videos, but I still find that teachers are afraid to do it or they're not sure or they don't follow through or whatever. So I invite you, if you want to make some, I will check them and I'll even publish them on my YouTube channel and link to you. If you'd like to make a play along video and get some promotion you might get out of being on my YouTube video. Yeah, so I would love to do that. Yeah. I think more people can collaborate. More teachers can collaborate like in the ways that like Noah Kageyama and I have collaborated, for example, the collaboration, for example, I have brought Noah to speak for my students. He's brought me to speak for his students. We also have cross promoted each other, as you mentioned, right? I created trainings that he's used in some of his courses and vice versa, these kinds of things, which goes back earlier to the fact that as a teacher, we don't have to have all the answers. We just have to point people to the right answers. Yeah. A lot of times pointing a student to a video from another teacher, it's a really valuable thing that you can do for that student. You're the one that did that. Those are some of the tools that I recommend. I think just like with loop pedals, like a lot of times people ask me, oh, how do I use a loop pedal? I will say, there's two buttons on a loop pedal and literally I can teach you 90% of everything you need to know about looping in 30 seconds. When I teach someone to do a loop, I say, this is what I want you to do. You're going to press this button and this button, and it's going to look like this. I'm going to say press, but that would be when you would push your foot. So it'd be like this press. And then you're hearing that's it. That is the loop. I'm going to demonstrate it one more time. Press. And then you're going to hear the loop thumb, right? Yeah. That is 90% of everything that is required on the technological side of using a loop pedal. Everything about looping is actually about learning to arrange. It's learning to arrange and compose. That's all that matters. So people get, to, they sit, they think they have a technology problem, but they don't. They have a problem with arranging. And in the same way, this question about technology for teaching or practice, it's about how do I teach and how do I practice? And if we address it from this perspective, then the technology is simple. So most people won't use email. Most people won't make YouTube videos. Most people won't make a play long video, but it's probably either their lack of organization or time management, or it's just their insecurity and fear, which is totally human. I feel insecurity and fear. I get it, but because I work for myself and or because I'm committed to this vision of impacting more people or trying to teach in deeper ways, I just take these risks of looking bad or having people unsubscribe like you did to my newsletter. Like that happens, but I feel like that's what I have to be willing to do if I want to try these bolder things as a teacher, which in some ways goes back to the idea of improvisation and teaching improvisation, because when we're showing up for our students in a more vulnerable, messy way, I think it can feel scary for us, but hopefully the result is worth it. Hopefully they also learn that my teacher's not perfect. He's this messy guy with part of his ceiling falling down who didn't shave today, but the point of teaching is that he cares, he's trying. And hopefully they can take that message. They can take that message. That would be probably how I would answer that. If you have any follow-up questions you'd like to ask, I'm happy to stay for another minute or two. Yeah, something just came to my mind now, which I think could be very valuable information for other uh, music teachers like me who want to find new ways of teaching uh, using technology and uh, using the tools that are out there, uh, which are like giving us uh, such a huge amount of possibilities nowadays to approach teaching. So I would be curious 
if you would turn it down to in percentage, how much percentage of your time do you spend teaching people online and creating videos for them versus teaching people live in workshops, in one-on-one -on -one lessons where they actually come to you in the practice room? How does that look like for you at the moment? Yeah, so I have group classes on Zoom where my students are playing the whole time. They're muted on their side, right? So they're playing for 90 minutes. So I have these big group Zoom group classes with very diverse students, but the way that I teach it is very unique. It's like a yoga class so that I have like people that are the highest level professionals, like master's degree from Juilliard and like full time with the New York Metropolitan Orchestra, like next to self-taught players that just have been playing for three years in one class together. I didn't even talk about this, but it's just a different way of teaching and they're playing the whole time, but it's relying on these elemental structures we talked about earlier because they're improvising most of the time. So I have these classes and then I have like my Facebook forum that I mentioned for my members where they can ask one-to-one -one questions and then get videos back from me if they want it. And then I also have premium opportunity for people to take personal lessons with me on Zoom. By the way, anybody that joins my practice community, including you, can get one free private lesson with me. Anybody in the world can join my practice community and take one private lesson with me for free with the, the beginning of their subscription and trial. So I insist on the onboarding, I think is important to meet the person, to know the person, to understand their problem, because I want to help them. I want to coach them from a holistic perspective. Yeah. Why do they want to play music? So that's very important to me is meeting each student, really having that relationship and being able to build on that. During my Zoom classes, I also have a chance at the end after the group class where people can ask one-to-one -one questions. I also have office hours where people can show up and they can play for me for 10 minutes or ask one question person to person. But I make a lot of content that is specifically for a person, a student that asks me a question and I make up a, a piece of content for that student, then other people benefit from it. So I'm making a lot of content for specific students, but then I'm broadcasting it and sharing it to the world and trying to distribute that. So that's a lot of what I'm doing. I also creating emails writing yeah. emails to explain things to people because i'm not just talking about bohold i'm talking about why is music important to you what are ways that you can improve your productivity what are ways that you can feel more joy self-appreciation self-love how can you make money how can you deal with the problems when you're not getting along with other musicians there are so many aspects of feeling satisfied and confident and happy in our lives as musicians. So I'm actually wanting to address all of these things as much as I can, because really my goal is not only to help all of these people, but also to change the culture of music education worldwide. So I'm yeah. trying to like show, to explore those frontiers and hopefully inspire other people to take it up. That's really powerful what you said to, to really change the way music is taught basically. On a global basis. Yeah, that's really beautiful. And maybe the last question now, what inspired you initially to take on that path of using technology for your students to do what you do right now with all your online courses, with your Zoom classes, with your Facebook group, email lists? What inspired you to do that? Was it out of a necessity you felt or did, did you have a feeling I need to learn to use these tools in order to be on the verge of music education in the modern age, or I would be interested. What was your motivation there? I think honestly, when I started to do it, it came more out of the need, the desire to survive as an entrepreneur, meaning as one who works for myself, as opposed to has one employer or one job, right? Like I yeah. didn't want to have to be dependent on one employer or one job. And I wanted to be able to be secure and to be able to survive so that I could provide for my family. And I thought, how can I increase my odds of survival and of also ha being able to not just surviving, but to survive and have the best possible quality of life for me and my family. And so I thought, 
this is a way to amplify my message and to draw more people in and to get the opportunity to serve them. Mm -hmm. So first I did, I'd say probably it came more from survival. And now I would say later on, 15 years in or 17, 18 years into this kind of, and really it's been longer than that, that I've been working for myself as a, in the music business. It's been since yeah. 1996 that I was working for myself. And now it's more also for wanting to make an impact, wanting to leave a legacy. Yeah, I, I, I totally get that. <laughs> and I think many musicians on the whole world, they feel the same. I think, and this is the stuff that they don't teach you in universities, like how to actually survive as a musician. <laughs> Imagine there would be classes in the university that teach you how to make a living from teaching music, using the internet, getting your own following of students, how to make a YouTube channel, how to attract an audience, how to sell your courses to people. I think this, if this would happen, if this would become part of the curricula in the universities, the lives of so many musicians would change because they would actually start making money from what they learned. Yeah. You know. This is part of the curriculum that I provide in my, in my community as well. And over the years, I used to have a separate service and I still do coaching for people, just helping them with their business. But in my practice community, like literally this Saturday, we're doing just a call where it's literally just a coaching call around business. Not all of my members are making music for money though, or working for themselves. But the ones that are, and the ones that want my help with that, they show up and they can ask me questions about all those things. And I answer them for them. But yeah, I totally agree with you. And also it's again, the same thing we were talking about earlier, like the principles of entrepreneurship or how to run your own business or how to work for yourself, they should not be confused with the platforms. Yeah. So it, there's a lot to be detangled, untangled there. What is the first step for me to, the first step for you to have that security and safety and survival, I would say is like some, a vision, some goals, some clear numbers, things like this. And then the next step is basically to do very basic foundational fundamental sales. It's just like offering direct one-to-one, -one, like offering services to people in exchange for value and building off of that. And that's what I did from 1996. Great talking with you, Gregor. I wish you luck with this project. I'm, I'm glad we're in touch. I'm glad we were able to connect. I look forward to connecting with you more soon. How, how, where can people find more about you? So for now, you can just find me on Instagram, on YouTube also, if you type my name, Gregor Fusenecker, if you look Lawrence from Von Hutting, that's my artist profile where I make electronic music. I'm thinking of making also a teaching website soon, but that's probably going to happen in the next year or so, or in the next few months, uh, because I need to start preparing the materials first. So you will hear from me in the future, but for now, <laughs> only Instagram and YouTube. Yeah. That's great. As you get into building your platforms and things like that, if you ever need a coach to help you with it, feel free to reach out. Yeah, I, I definitely will. Yeah. Thanks for the offer. <laughs> uh, Hi, man. I, can, I, can, I can do the promo for you uh, go check out us at uh, chrisfaust.com uh, creative strings <laughs> you will get amazing value from his course oh uh, thank you thank you very much thanks everybody for bye -bye. listening all right take care bye bye thanks a lot